Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek. Welcome to the Game of Thrones pre-show episode two. I have got a very special guest on today, one of my favourite people in the community, one of the cleverest and most erudite members of our community. Please can you welcome Gemma. Thank you for having me on. Robert, you always give the best introductions. It's almost become a bit of a, an in-joke for you and I. We, we can try to outdo each other with introducing each other every time we, we work together on streams or podcasts or whatever. I'm really happy to be here. Um, let's talk about Game of Thrones. Absolutely. So, guys, the way that we're going to do this, this is going to be a two hours. Um, we're going to keep it as close to that as we possibly can. So it gives everyone a chance to get away after this, grab something to eat or something before the episode itself. Um, this time uh, we're going to be going as much as we possibly can with questions from the chat. Obviously, if there are any super chats, we'll come to them as soon as we can. Um, I'd like to if we can focus the first half of this on what happened last episode and then the second half on on what we think might happen in the next episode. Uh, but let's just sort of kick off uh, overall. We did get a couple of Super Chats before we went live. I'll come to them in just one second. Uh, but Gemma, what were your your main thoughts? What's your big takeaway from episode one? Um, it, it was a bit slow, um, I'm not going to lie. I, but they had so much to get out of the way. And I feel that they got most of that out of the way. Um, there was quite a few light-hearted moments in the episode. There was there was quite a bit of humour. There was the the Disney dragon flying incident, um, and and I feel that it, a lot some of it didn't really feel very Game of Thronesy because it was quite light considering what's coming for them. But I think that's maybe the intention was to kind of juxtapose that with how dark we are about to go. I think things are going to nosedive fairly rapidly from this episode onwards. Yeah, I think so. It wouldn't surprise me if there's a slightly lighter one around episode four or five. But yeah, this episode one for me, I agree. They, they, there was a lot of reunions. There was a lot of yeah. stuff that they had to get through. It was uh, the kinds of things, to be honest, most of us could have worked out right at the end of season seven, these are the things that has to happen. We've got to get the Golden Company in. We've got to get all these people. John and Danny have got to arrive at Winterfell. We've got all these reunions. Uh, we've got to have the, the Army of the Dead reintroduced, all of that. So we hit most of those bases. And I think, broadly speaking, they did. Uh, they set it up well for what's going to happen over the course of the next few episodes. I said I'd quickly come to those super chats um, uh, there from Maura Lee. Maura, thank you so much. Uh, very generous, as always, uh, saying uh, here's to episode two. I uh, would like to understand more about the Night King's motives. Yes, you and me both. <laughs> Is all of this just for revenge uh, for the wrong done to him by the children? Uh, Battle of good versus evil, or is there more of his story to come uh, also saying for Ghost and for the Stark family uh, direwolves, uh, since there will be battle at Winterfell, I'd love to see Ghost and the Super Pack Nymeria and a Super Pack within their home and also for the mods. Well, let's pick up on one of them, shall we? Uh, one of the big takeaways, uh, we'll, we'll come back to, I think, to Ghost and Nymeria when we're talking about episode two, Maura, so we'll answer that one a little bit later in the show. But let's let's get to this one first. There was a lot of talk after that episode about the message, if it was a message, the bit of art that the Night King, the Army of the Dead, left at the last hearth. Um, do you think we now can make a reasonable guess about what the Night King wants? Um, I was actually watching LML's stream the other day, um, not his stream, um, he dropped a video a few days ago, it, it, was, it was a relatively short one, it was really, really good, and LML as usual blew my mind as he always does, um, and he compared the image of the Night King being turned into the Night King at the heart tree with the spirals around him to the image of Ned Umber, in kind of the same scenario, one being of ice and the other one being of fire. Um, I'm, I don't, LML has his own conclusions. Um, and if you haven't seen that video, I would highly recommend it. Um, but, uh, and, it, and it's something to do with burning of weird words and things which doesn't bode very well for Brown since he's so kind of connected with the weird words. Um, I think ice has to end in fire or the other way around. 
Sure. I think I agree. So I had LML on last week, actually, for this. Uh, and we had a really good conversation uh, around a few of these issues. He uh, he went off, produced that video. I uh, dropped a few thoughts in my episode breakdown for uh, for episode one. Uh, so, yeah, I I think I'm probably with him. I still haven't had a chance to, to watch that or pretty much any videos this week, it has to be said. Um, but... Uh, in t- I think our thinking's on the same lines that that was very clearly an image of the, the the symbol of the image of the standing stones where the Night King was uh, made, and it for me it just felt too symbolic on the part of the showrunners n- to be coincidence that they thrust a burning sword light bringer imagery into the heart of that killing this blue-eyed boy and then everything burned around it that wasn't a natural thing those the the the, the rest of it shouldn't have burned if you just try thrust a sword into the middle the rest of it wouldn't naturally have burned but uh, it did so it felt very symbolic and i think that this is something i know smokescreen has been talking about this for a long time as well uh, this idea of them burning as as the end to sort of undo the magic as a way of it not being just a big battle and the good guys win and the bad guys lose, but we have to undo the magic uh, that's there uh, that created the the White Walkers in the first place. And I think that's the point, isn't it? Because we've seen White Walkers themselves um, approaching fire and the fire dissipating before them, like you know, literally shrinking back away from them. So I don't think this is, you know, that we just have to burn the White Walkers, I think something else has to burn. Something else, Weirwood is is what LML specifically said, but a very specific Weirwood, perhaps. Well, yes. Yeah, so uh, my my theory uh, that I think LML was going with as well is that um, in the books, it makes sense for this to be the Isle of Faces. That's been flagged up quite a lot. It's very important early on. Uh, and it makes sense as if the sort of the final whatever happens there in the books on the show they haven't really mentioned that although it did appear in the uh, the title sequence for the first time that i noticed um so it may but what they have focused on is the creation of the night king the, the and that pattern of standing stones with the weirwood in the middle so it would make sense to me if that is the thing that needs to be destroyed to end the magic as it were a um, couple of super chats quickly coming through. Dark Mother saying with six dollars sixty six, this uh, the number of LML uh, saying prepare for myth head boarding, guys. I think that probably means that LML has finished his live stream. Uh, he normally times it for roughly when I'm starting mine. So hi, if you've just come over from there, very good to see you. Uh, we were talking about LML just now, and we have uh, Lucas Giorgio saying thanks for your content. Was wondering if you think people are forgetting Sansa. So we're moving on to Sansa now. Forgetting Sansa knows the importance of food after witnessing the King's Landing riots. Yeah, so so let's think about Sansa for a moment. What what's what's your take on her? There's been a talk in this episode about how she's very clever and that she's clearly last season was doing all of the other kind of the logistics. Is this is this who she is now, or are they building this up to something? Yeah, they seem to be very focused on Sansa being focused on the logistics of any given situation. Um, When we watch the first trailer um, and we see the dragons flying overhead and Sansa's watching them, I made a joke. um, Oh, she's thinking, who's going to feed them? And I was like, I called it. I completely called it, even though it was a joke. Um, (laughs) But yeah, she's she's very much interested in looking after the people. Um, She's being set up as very queenly. There's no way around that. Um, A lot of people have made the comparisons, of course, with, with Elizabeth I. Um, I, I can see Sansa surviving all of this. They're setting her up in a very specific way for a reason, to be somebody who's looking at, say, more of a bigger picture. You know, John's very focused on the immediate threat for obvious reasons. Um, a lot of the other characters, Leanna Mormont, Danny, they seem to be very focused on who is going to rule, Cersei as well. Um, whereas Sansa, she's not I'm not sure how seriously she's taking the threat. I think when she actually sees the White Walkers, 
that's going to change rapidly. But her immediate concern and her concern for the future is the northerners, the people of the north. She's taking her role as the Lady of Winterfell extremely seriously. And that was actually something that Catelyn Stark um, took control of while Ned was the Lord of Winterfell. And Cat, by all accounts, certainly in the books, did, did a stellar job at that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that um, they are playing up Sansa's cleverness in this. I do mm -hmm. wonder whether there's a, a kind of a flip here that they were... Uh, she was saying to Tyrion about how you used to. I used to think you were the cleverest person in the world, and and then next scene we go across to um, John and Arya talking about how Sansa herself thinks herself that she's the cleverest person. Now, is this setting her up to actually have some sort of a fall in the same way that Tyrion seems to be having a fall? I don't know. But in answer to that specific question about food, yes, I think the riots in King's Landing will have played its part. There's also. Uh, a subplot in the books about food stockpiling that happens over in the Eyrie. Littlefinger's got some sort of a game going on, as he always does, a bit of a hustle, gathering all the food in, uh, knowing that he can then, uh, when it becomes a scarce resource, he can flog it off for anything he wants. So uh, I think that this is just sort of playing across a little bit of that kind of side plot going on there. Well, it was um, so significant, wasn't it? The, the riots of King's Landing is is while all the noble lords were playing their game of thrones. Um, they, and I think there's a line in the text that says nobody was shouting Renly or Joffrey or Stannis anymore. Bread was king now. They, they just want yeah. food, you know. And I think Sansa, yes, probably took some very um, important lessons from that of the, the baser needs that people have like just being fed and clothed and warm. Exactly. And it has to be said that she she is the person who is responsible for Winterfell's defences being as good as they are, because John has been away for his, for ages and then he comes back and uh, it was her who was overseeing, making sure that armour was everywhere. It was, she was making sure that food was there. She was making sure that people were being trained up um, so she is the person who's been overseeing all of this. And then suddenly I kind of understood it when she like gets a little bit snarky about that. And well, now I've got a whole new army and some dragons to feed as well, because it will be not what she was planning for. But yeah, she's, she is the person who's responsible for so much. Um, let's just quickly get to a couple of super chats. Eddie Brooke, thank you so much. Uh, and Syncret saying thank you to Indie Geek for all you do. You're very welcome. Uh, LML popped in saying, have a great show, uh, burn them all. Yes, so uh, I, I would recommend, and there are very few people that I would recommend videos without having watched them, but I would very much recommend that video that LML produced um, that Gemma was talking about a moment ago. Perhaps one of the mods, if they haven't already, could drop it a link in the chat. That would be fantastic. Nose Kills says, George R. R. Martin, a uh, quote from George R. R. Martin, the villain is just the hero of the other side. Uh, Danny's hard-ass ways made her our hero on the other side of the na uh, narrow sea. Now they cause friction with the Starks. Is this alarming or filler TV drama? So, yeah, I think it's a really good question. The, the one thing that they've been building up a lot are these, in episode one in particular, but also quite a bit before that, even last season, uh, the, the frictions between various camps and characters up in the north. And last season, there was a bit of a storm in the key, teacup between friction between Sansa and Arya, and I think the general feeling was that that was just a bit overplayed. Are the frictions that are clearly there between Danny and Tyrion and Sansa and Danny and... Sam and Danny and lots of people and Danny uh, are these are these actually significant or is them is this them just creating drama? What what do you think, Gemma? I, I think perhaps to an extent, yes. Um, I think and um, when you if you cast your mind back to when John and Danny first met, they they weren't making goo goo eyes across the throne room and Dragonstone at each other. No, that was a very tense meeting. Um, they kind of had a few things to get ironed out before they could actually develop any kind of relationship, and obviously that blossomed um, eventually. But 
I think in order for them to, to for us as watchers to accept the fact that any of the northerners accept Danny, we have to see her earn it, as Cersei would say. Um, that there has to be that tension because what where's the drama in them accepting her as her queen if they didn't mistrust her in the first instance and then she did something, say, burn a ton of uh ice zombies with her dragons and save a lot of people perhaps um to turn their their opinions around perhaps but i am a bit concerned with the way she is being set up especially that sam danny jura scene which i've seen some horrendously hilarious memes about but um that was heartbreaking um, we were never sure how Sam was going to take that news, given his relationship with his father. But I think we were all on board that he wouldn't be too impressed about his brother being burned alive. But Sam took that way harder than I think any of us fully thought he would. And it's Danny is really not being cast in a good light right now, is she? She's she's not. And in that particular scene, someone, uh, I think it was uh, in the chat um, on my Thursday live stream, I do two, if, you, if you're not aware, I do two live streams all the way through the season. This one, which is my pre-show, and my Thursday live stream, which is 6pm Eastern Standard Time, which I do all the way through the year. Um, and I think it was in that one that somebody came up with the point that actually, in, if you're just trying to think about it objectively, she probably did quite a reasonable job there. She didn't try and hide what she'd done. Um, uh, she was open and honest, gave the reasons for it. And when Sam was trying to excuse himself, she just said, of course. So she could have done it a lot worse. She could have said, well, you know, they were asking for it or uh, anything like that. And she didn't do that. She wasn't particularly great, but at the same time, she wasn't doing it particularly badly. Yeah, she but wasn't apologetic, but she's a queen. Right. Yes, exactly. So the, I think I agreed. So they have clearly set up a lot of tensions with Danny. I think that the this is going to be something for episodes four and five, really. This is my guess, is that this is where we're going to have a big battle. They've told us loads of times there's going to be a big battle in episode three. The other side of that is when people are going to be starting to think further forward about who actually is the, the understanding of John. Uh, being the true king is probably going to come out. Um, and then we've got this whole struggle. They teed it up ages ago with this whole issue about Varys. Is Varys going to betray Daenerys? We've got the tensions with Tyrion. Sam, as we've seen, he's been set up. He was he's giving an impassioned speech to Jon about how he should be the, the, the king and how he should be pressing his claim. They've clearly set this up, this idea up that there is going to be people taking sides over this. And so I think that it's not just set dressing. In fact, I think that I would say if they had not shown any of this tension, it would have felt a little bit weird. Yeah. Um, if, if she got up to Winterfell and everyone went, ah, fantastic, great, great to have you back, love those Targaryens come in, then we'd have gone, oh, really? Is that is that exactly what was what was likely to happen? So I think that it makes more sense to me, and I think they are building up to something, and I think it's going to be quite a big something in the second half of this season. Hundred um, percent. I've had a few people on my in my comments section over the last week and Patreons as well um, questioning how Kyburn knew that the wall had fallen, and then that leaps into speculation about a mole at Winterfell. Is somebody spying and sending messages back to King's Landing? That kind of thing. So that's an interesting consideration. It is. I. Th I mean. Whether they play into that, I don't know. My, I, I don't think that they need to tell us. I think yeah. that it's entirely possible that um, he he took over, as far as we can tell, large parts of Barris's network, uh, and so he may well have people in the Night's Watch anyway. Um, uh, so he also he was uh, at the um, down in Old Town, and he studied with the Maesters and because he studies a whole load of stuff that they didn't want him to be studying, there's a fair chance that he may actually have some knowledge glass candles. That wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if he turned out to have a glass candle just to treat it as a science project rather than a magic project. Hmm, I wonder how this works, that kind of thing. I don't, on, I don't find it a huge mystery that he knew. 
I think that it's uh, it just it pushed the plot along and it showed us how Daenerys sort of how Cersei was happy uh, with that news. And I think that was the key point, rather than letting us know that that he knew about it. I also thought an interesting point of that interaction. It was very brief between Cersei and Kyburn. Is that yes, Cersei was clearly happy, but Kyburn didn't seem so happy about the situation. So I wonder if that's going to play out somehow. Tension in the Red Keep. Well, yes. And I think that there's a... We have to remember that Kyburn is not this loyal servant to Cersei that she thinks he is. Yeah. She thinks that he's this most loyal person who's always going to stand by her and all the rest of it. He is just playing her. He is using her to get what he wants, which is all the resources and time and space to do the research that he wants to do. He he was a social climber. He From the very first moment they, they found him, he was working his way up from Jamie to Cersei and all the way up. He's climbed up from nothing to the very top. I think that he is clever. Clearly he's clever. And I think he realises that actually, although Cersei might be very blasé about, oh yes, so the army of the dead's come south, he looked at and may well have grabbed the bit of the arm of the white. If you remember, back in the dragon pit, he picked one up and stared at it. He will know what it is that's coming at them. And I think he actually realises the significance of this, not just for uh, the north, but for all of Westeros. And Absolutely. so I, he is, I don't think he might, he would turn on her. I think he's much more likely to just scarf her. To his tail. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. If, if he thinks that the, the time is gone. And I say it all the time, at least one of the characters that we consider to be part of the bad guys will survive because this is not going to be a all, only good people survive, all the bad people die kind of story. There will be some characters who we consider to be part of the bad guys who will survive in some way. 100 uh, percent. Broken Birds, thank you so much for, uh, for the super chat saying, Gemma, you are gorgeous in all caps. Uh, and although I've been, I was teasing her a bit before, that I'm absolutely sweltering here. It's very, it's a very hot day in my part of England, but Gemma appears to be wearing the thickest woolly jumper that I've, I've probably see. So, uh, um, uh, but, but Robert, I could literally listen to you all day. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for being amazing. You say that's very kind. Uh, Brian Michael saying, I've loved your breakdown on all of Game of Thrones. Thank you so much. And Jack Hurst um, saying, did you shed a tear when you found out Ed Sheeran's cameo character had his eyelids burned off? <laughs> this, for those who uh, missed this story, this was confirmation. If you picture the scene in episode one where you have Bronn who's there and the, the, the women surrounding him were paying not much attention to him. They were actually talking about the dragons and what the dragons have been up to and all the rest of it. And they talked about one soldier, uh, Lannister soldier, having his eyelids burned off. And there was official confirmation from Team GOT that that was Ed Sheeran. So, well, they um, said Eddie, the ginger one, didn't they? Eddie, the ginger one, exactly. Yeah. So uh, this is, um, it's an in-joke. Um, did I shed a tear? I, I did not, sadly. Um, but I know that Gemma is a big Ed Sheeran fan. Are you? <laughs> this is not true. It's really not true. I, I, not my kind of music at all. And no tears were shed for poor ginger Eddie with no eyelids. <laughs> and, and he can't he can't cry now either. This is a sad, sad story. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, um, let's uh, quickly go back. There was a, a question early on from Maura Lee that I said we'd come back to. As as I suspected might happen, we dotted around a little bit rather than focusing just on last last episode. Uh, so so let's pick up on this one. Let's talk about the the dire wolves um, now. There are two still knocking about. There's Ghost and there's Nymeria, Arya's direwolf, who we saw briefly last season. And I know I am not alone in being disappointed we didn't have the big Jon Snow ghost reunion last episode. Um, so Maura's question is, um, since there is going to be a battle, will we see Ghost, Nymeria or anyone else at defending Winterfell. I, I will pitch with Ghost, yes, Nymeria, probably not. But what do you think? 
Um, I've got a couple of thoughts on Ghost. I mean, Joe Bauer, the VFX supervisor for Game of Thrones, said in an interview that Ghost would feature a lot in season eight. And so far, that's not, not happened at all. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, for me, the reunion with John and Arya was the perfect place to include Ghost because Nymeria was in the scene when John and Arya said goodbye. So that would have just been beautiful placing for me. Um, so I, not only was I disappointed at the absence of Ghost, but specifically in that scene, there should have been a dire wolf. Um, a lot of people are saying that, you know, there's a very, there's, it's like 0 0.3 seconds in the trailer and people have paused it at the exact spot and screenshot it. And it appears to be horses hooves, you know, like Battle of the Bastards style that we saw kind of trampling the earth. Um, and a lot of people are saying that these are not just horses, that these are also paws. Um, so there's been a bit of excitement around the possibility of some kind of super pack, Nymeria coming in. So more than one wolf, several wolves is what people are saying. Um, and people are speculating that those wolves are fighting in the Great War, which would indicate that Nymeria is indeed coming back. I'm not sure I've scanned that picture a lot. Um, I, can, I think I can see at least one wolf, which would be ghost, as you said. I'm not sure if we're seeing an entire super pack. Um, I know a lot of people say it's budget reasons that they don't have the dire wolves. It's not. Um, the Inuit hounds, that are the dogs that they use, um, don't size up very well. They look very clunky and they have to mess around with the speed and the cadence of how they walk um, because it, it looks strange. And also apparently the dogs are rather naughty and not easy to work with. So that might have a big impact on why we've not seen as many dire wolves as we would like. Yeah, I think uh, I've, I've often used the shorthand of its, uh, its budgetary reasons. I think, uh, yes, you're right. But what the point here is that they are not being excluded for any kind of plot or character reasons. It's, it's simply that, yeah. that there's logistics which is preventing them from doing it. So it's, it's not, a, not a, uh, that Ghost is actually off doing something really cool. They're pretending the ghost is there. They just aren't uh, showing him on the uh, the, the screen. Um, so uh, where do we get to? So uh, Ma Rion, thank you. That's a very generous super chat. Thank you so much. Saying, I'd just like to send my regards from the very, very north of Germany. Um, is it Kiel? I'm trying to work out that's Anyway, I'm not going to guess where in the north of Germany. Robert and Gemma, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Marion. Uh, Sheeny Donut says, my two favourite YouTubers in the same live stream. Thank you. Uh, and then Thomas Bingham uh, said, uh, question below, uh, which I did cut and paste across, which says, uh, in season eight, episode one, so the first episode, we see Bran give Tyrion a deathly stare. This reminded me of a similar stare given to an exiled Tyrion by the Red Priestess in season five, episode three. Do you think these are connected? So uh, if I'm trying to remember what it was, there was uh, when Tyrion was on his way across Essos, there was certainly a moment when a, a Red uh, Priestess did turn and look at him in a kind of like unerring way. Is like, I, I, I see you when he thought he was being oh so incognito. Um, do I think there's a connection only in as much as Tyrion is important? Yeah. And so two magic users both spot that. Now, my best guess on the episode one uh, stare from uh, Bran was that Bran is aware, he saw the conversation between Sansa and Tyrion, where Sansa basically says you're being stupid, thinking that Cersei's going to um, uh, is going to send her troops up. Of course, she's not. Um, and then Tyrion just kind of like takes it on the chin and, and pretends he has reasons on the rest of it. I suspect that he suspects that that's not true. That that Cersei will not send the troops north either. Uh, but he has his own reasons for that. I did a video yesterday. If you want to see my thinking through uh, through a that issue. So I think that was Bran knowing that there's something else going on there. And I think the fact that they showed us that is, is just a little nod to there's something more 
to this than meets the eye. It's not just Bran being nosy about a conversation about uh, the the two people who used to be married. It's just <laughs> that he he knows there's an extra layer going on here. But did you read anything else into that? Uh, that weird look from Bran. All all Bran's looks are weird, obviously. Uh, but did you did you read anything else into it? Not really. I'm kind of with you on this. I think my takeaway point, like you, was Tyrion's important in some way, shape or form. And I think whenever Bran does this creepy stare down thing that he does to a lot of the characters, I think the implication is here that Bran's reading that person like he's downloading their information. So he's not necessarily just staring them out for creepy's sake. He's, he's taking in what's going on. So maybe Bran was replaying the conversation that Tyrion and Cersei had at the end of the last season and Bran saw the extended version because for us it was cut off perhaps. So maybe there's something to that. Um, I think Bran had overheard Sansa and Tyrion's conversation and thought, oh, I'll just see if there's anything more to this. So he, he downloaded Tyrion and uh, that's what the creepy stares are all about, Bran essentially downloading he does the same with danny when she arrives he stares at her and then boom dragon this wall blah 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 he knows everything and and i think the implication of the stare is very much that bran is reading them yeah i think that's right i think the only thing i would add to that is that my understanding of what was going on in episode one was that secretly bran was pulling the strings on a huge amount of what was happening there 100%. He, uh, w there, there was the big meeting to start with, them, and there's all the, the the line where they're all greeting everyone. And yes, he then gives his his weird things, telling Danny what's been going on, and then basically says, "We haven't got time for this. Let's go off and do some other stuff." And it's like, "Come on, guys, we need to move on to the next thing that's important." Then you got the the Tyrion look, which, uh, as I say, I interpreted up interpreted something into that. Sam. Uh, going to tell John about his parentage happened because Bran told him to go and do it then. And that was the precise right time when Sam actually was motivated to do it because he came out being all emotional about the fact this this Targaryen queen had killed his nearest and dearest. And then uh, Bran reminds him, oh, by the way, she's not actually the queen. You should probably go and tell John this. Yeah, uh, that reveal exact... came at yeah. a very specific point for Sam, didn't it? Where Sam had almost an agenda. Yes, exactly. And Bran would have known that he had an agenda and he pushed him to do that. And then at the end, obviously, we get Bran who's there waiting for Jamie when he arrives. So, and that is inevitably going to be leading on, I would have thought almost immediately in episode two with what happens with Jamie when uh, people know that he's there. So Bran is the one who's, pulling all of this together and uh, is directing events just sort of from slightly behind the camera sometimes. Um, question from uh, Warg, what is, uh, what is it good for? <laughs> Which is a great name. Uh, it probably works better if you pronounce it Warg. What is it good for? Uh, what are your opinions about the idea that Daenerys could be the final big bad? Now, uh, yeah, we kind of touched on Danny slightly earlier in this it's very clear that she is being built up um to have conflict with people and there are certainly times when in the past when she's threatened to do things like burning down king's landing and uh, she's had to be uh, sort of pulled back by Tyrion, and Tyrion certainly makes a big a uh, big thing of this, that this is his role to temper her instincts, and Varys seems to be thinking this as well. If Varys and Tyrion aren't on her side, and she doesn't have their tempering influence, might she go and do something really big and scary? That, for me, is the only thing that is kind of taking it that way, because I think broadly they haven't built her up to be as evil at heart, perhaps sometimes impetuous and doing things off the cuff in a kind of flame happy way, but not necessarily act actively wanting to do an evil thing. But what, what's your take on her? Um, yeah, I'm kind of in the same place. 
can I just quickly stop? Lucifer means Lightbringer says, please ask Robert to bestow mod powers on like several people because we need backup. Um, the backup issue is because, um, yes, we are aware that the episode has been leaked. I have not seen it. I have no intention of watching this in anything other than 1080. I've waited this long. I'm not watching a leak. Um, so please do not talk about them because I don't want to know and everybody in the chat doesn't want to know. If you want to watch a leak, go for it, but please keep that to yourself. We've got a matter of hours. We, we, we are patient people. We waited 595 days. We can wait a few hours. Um, but yeah, the mods are doing a stellar job to keep on top of that. I'm kind of only half looking at the chat at the moment because leaks are unfortunately being dropped so stop it's not yes it's the, not the, the internet is is dark and full of spoilers so uh guys uh, i try and keep this as much as we possibly can uh spoiler free obviously can't stop everything that everybody says i am as we speak going through and uh, bestowing a spanner on a few people in the chat uh mm -hmm. but while that's happening uh Gemma, why don't uh why don't you sort of um carry on talking about danny um, uh, do you do you think there's a chance that she could be the big bad in the second half of the season? Yeah, there's completely a chance of this. We've been saying this for years, um, absolutely years. Um, and what's the whole, you flip a coin for a Targaryen to see which side it lands on. Um, and you spoke about Varys and Tyrion in particular having these advisors that would kind of check her worst impulses and Varys, Tyrion and Davos specifically had a conversation where Varys pointed out she doesn't listen well they don't listen to us meaning young people don't listen to old people I think was the the general idea of that conversation but Varys did specifically say I'm not sure if they would even listen to us so maybe that applies to things other than proposals um yeah this has been an ongoing discussion you know will Danny be the savior is she this messiah type figure is a lot of the symbolism that surrounds us i'm sure lml can attest to um so much symbolism surrounding danny regarding being some kind of savior or prince that was promised in a, in a kind of sense or will she go the other way you know she's kind of running along the fence and it's which which way will she fall essentially still don't know which way to call that one. Um, people in the chat are now putting the, um, every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin. Thank you, Emily Keeling, uh, for the reminder of the quote. Yeah, it, it's there, so who knows? Absolutely, and guys, so I've dropped uh, another couple of spanners in there, so um, uh, you may find that you're now a moderator. Um, Amanda, I'm talking to you right now. Um, uh, so uh, we've got, uh, oh, uh, Megan V actually just gave a super chat saying, can you mod the disputed lands? Um, no post spoiler leaks. Yes, absolutely. I've just done that. Um, AU Pack Mule says the fiery hand. Thank you very much for that super chat, by the way. The fiery hand, a thousand, no more, no less. Are they undead and can't be healed, uh, killed? So uh, for those who are unaware of who the fiery hand are, they are based over in Volantis, which is where the, the big temple of the Lord of Light is. And they're basically the temple guard. There's a thousand of them, uh, and they're supposedly uh, uber good warriors. Uh, so the thinking is that Melisandre um, has gone back to there. She's definitely coming back to Winterfell, I think. Uh, is she going to bring the fiery hand with her, or is she going to bring something else? What, what, what do you reckon, Gemma? Is there is there, is there a chance we're going to see a whole load of followers of R'hllor just suddenly bursting in uh, to to the action and kind of like a Helm's Deep charging down the mountain to save everybody? Way could be, could be the here comes the cavalry twist. I mean, they already use that twist in the Battle of the Bastards, but who knows, they might use that again. Um, we've got fire and ice already in the form of the White Walkers and Danny and her dragons, but a little bit more fire in the in the mix would 
even things out a tiny bit, I suppose. Yes, Mel is definitely coming back. She's told Arya that she's going to see her again. She's told Varys that she's going to see him again. And they are both obviously at Winterfell. Um, I spent a disordinate amount of time scouring the background extras in season one for a conspicuous elderly lady in a hood or something, just thinking, is she already there? Um, obviously, under her guise as an old lady, because we never really got any payoff to that scene, did we? What what was the point in that, other than to express just how old she really is? But if we don't see this lady, this old elderly lady again, I'm not really sure what the point of that was. But yeah, I think that's the general speculation that's being tossed around at the moment is that the Order of the Fiery Hand is going to be accompanying Mel. They are known Danny supporters. We've seen that across ESOS. If Cersei has some support from ESOS, then why shouldn't Winterfell? Yeah, I think I would agree with that. My 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 general take is that I don't think... Well, my, my general take is Melisandre is going to be coming across. I think that the reason why we saw that sort of aged character was to show that she was she was very old, she was very weary, and that the only thing which is keeping her going is her desire to be, see the end of this thing that she's been devoting her life to, uh, as she sees it, the great battle between Rolor and uh, and the great other. And I think that means that the... the her thought that she's going to die there, um, the fact that Davos has said that he'll kill her with his own hands, the fact that we know that she's going to see Arya again, or she says she's going to see Arya again, I think that there's a very good chance that she's going to come over and she may well be killed by somebody, but she won't mind if she feels she's done her job. And I think that will make it quite a bittersweet death for someone like Davos, for example, because actually she'd be okay with it. And I don't think that that's exactly what you would want. She would think that everything she's done was to a purpose. Uh, I think she's definitely going to be uh, trying to give John a fiery sword. Well, they're probably going to give John a fiery sword. She thinks he's the prince that was promised. Mm -hmm. She thinks the prince that was promised has to have a fiery sword. So I think that she will try and give him that. Um, let's quickly uh, we've got a couple more uh, super chats to catch up on uh, danielle montoya saying been loving your content thank you probably have listened uh, to hours uh, well uh, thank you a lot what is your opinion of the kyburn is secretly loyal to the starks rob for saving him and he wants to kill the lannister boys not cersei i personally think that kyburn is loyal to himself not to uh, any house at all i don't think that I, th I think that Cersei does want to kill uh, definitely Tyrion, and I think that in a peak of anger, probably wants to kill Jaime, who she considers to have betrayed her now. So I think that did come from her. Kyburn, may he could be playing uh, a clever game and, and uh, seeing that as the way to win and doesn't have to go through Cersei, he can do it himself. Uh, but I think in all practice, that was as much... There's, as, as I'm sure most people in the fandom know, the two actors who play Cersei and Bronn don't get on in real life and never appear in the same scene. So we can't actually have her going and personally asking Bronn to do it. So sending Kyburn was probably just their way of getting around that. So I don't think that's what it was. My read of Kyburn's character is that he's just out for himself. He's not secretly loyal to a particular house. But did you, do you read Kyburn in a different way? No, I'm, I was nodding my head off um, because we were only two people on this stream. Nobody saw me, but I, I was like a nodding dog. Kyburn is Kyburn's man. Um, he always has been. He will serve whomever it suits him, whoever enables him or allows him to do the things that he wants to do, i.e. his science, his stuff. Um, I do think one important thing to remember is that Cersei believes the mountain, Robert Strong, whoever he's known as in the show, is is hers. He's not. That's yeah. Kyburn's. That's Kyburn's monster. Um, and and I've for a long time thought that if it came down to it, if there was a betrayal or if Kyburn wanted to leave, um, Cersei's go-to is to set the mountain on them. And that's the one person she wouldn't be able to do that with. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, Kyburn is his own person and his 
his creations, his creatures are his creatures. He will have them fighting for Cersei for as long as he thinks that is useful for him and for his um, uh, for his ends. The moment that he thinks that he's best served personally by getting out of there, he will get out of there. Uh, John Schwitzer, uh, thank you so much, saying, uh, I love your channel. Thank you. In what way would you be most bothered by how the show could end? In what way would you be most pleased? Oh, this is quite a... Um, Big question. So in terms of how I would be most bothered is if if we don't get proper answers on uh, the big questions about the, the White Walkers or we, we just get like a battle and the Night King is killed. I think that would be the thing which would bother me the most is the, the creation of a, uh, a an, an evil baddie that we never understood what exactly what they're about. I think we've got some ideas now, but I think they just need to make it very clear and they need to make it show how the the night king the army of the dead can be the threat can be ended in a way that isn't just well it turns out that Jon snow is a better swordsman than the night king that that for me wouldn't be a very satisfying end in terms of what uh, would leave me most pleased i think every character arc has to come to a, a satisfying conclusion it doesn't mean it needs to be a good one or a happy one but it mean, means it has to be a satisfying one one that makes sense of the story that has happened for that person all the way through so characters changing in the last season they're changing uh, who they are what they are um uh, that's the kind of thing that would really annoy me and this is why i spent quite a bit of time thinking this week about Tyrion and his motivations because it's been nagging me a lot that for the first five or six seasons time and again it was Tyrion's character is that he drinks and he knows things he's clever he's he's got away with words and then in the last season or two he hasn't mm. and that it's not just bad writing yes the the lack of killer lines is because they haven't got George R. R. Martin's uh, dialogue to go on but it's a deliberate choice to make it look as if he is making mistake after mistake after mistake. That is a deliberate thing that the showrunners have done and it has to lead to something for Tyrion. It can't just be a, a random thing. So uh, I, I need each character's arc naturally to make sense of everything that's happened all the way through. But did you did you have any thoughts on it? It's a really big question. But... <laughs> it is, but you, you pretty much stole my exact answers, to be fair. I, I'm the same. I don't want... The conclusion to be they have a big battle they kill the night king all of the whites drop to the floor and hooray we, we won yay um john sits on the iron throne with danny and they, they have millions of babies and everybody lives happily ever after um i love lord of the rings i really did but i do not want to see that because that is the lord of the rings ending essentially um i want to see some really heartfelt sacrifices and i think we're going to um uh, what i do want to see like you said is, is closure i i know we're going to be walking away from this in five short weeks with questions speculations and continuation of theories they cannot possibly give us all of the answers that we want not in a million years but i think for the like you said for the main characters like the top seven the big ones i want to see some resolution um i'm not sure how they're going to give it to us maybe we'll have a little flash forward into the future just to give us an idea or or maybe like a little monologue at the end and sansa went on to blah 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 and i, that, that would be <laughs> I, I don't want that cheesy and horrendous, i do not but, want that <laughs> So sorry I, I normally i normally <laughs> allow you to talk but I, this is this is one thing actually which reminds me that i hate the 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 ha end of harry potter the 20 years later uh look how they've all grown i that that for me would be a thing i would hate i am completely okay with the the the, the fate to black and slightly mysterious about how the land is going to be managed oh, going so forward you're, you're i am perfectly fine amazing. with that what I do not want, and they've incidentally they've they've talked about the ending in quite vague terms, uh, the showrunners, and how they liked, and this is where this thought has come from. Don't blame me; it comes from the showrunners. How much they liked the ending of the Sopranos. Now, uh, 
if you, if anyone's watched the ending of the Sopranos, I won't spoil it in case you ever haven't, because I know it's an old series, but it's well worth watching without knowing where it all goes. But with without it, it is just a wait. What what just happened? Yeah. Kind of yeah. ending. Right. And and it's just you have to watch it again and figure out what what on earth is going on, and uh, the 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 showrunners have talked about that as being really an inspirational way to end it, and also the ending to Breaking Bad. They uh, they uh, sort of name checked as what they thought was a good ending. So th that's the kind of feel. If you can imagine the endings to those two shows, that's the kind of feel that the showrunners are going into this with thinking works well as an ending to an epic TV drama. So I think we're going to see a sort of like a, an ending that's uh, uh, not going to tell us the full story, but it's going to have the equivalent of, well, we know this character is going to, has got some freedom. We know that character has died. We know this character is doing this yeah. and we can leave them to it. That I think is where they're going to head. It's it's going to be, no matter which way they go about this, a very delicate balancing act between the the fade to black with the are they dead? Are they alone? And, and then leaving us in this realm of forever perpetually arguing and speculating on how you know our personal interpretations. And then the other end of that spectrum is is the Harry Potter one, which thanks for the spoiler, by the way, Robert. I haven't seen Harry Potter. But <laughs> The 20 years later thing, I, 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 I'm, I'm not, I don't write for television. I don't know how they're going to do this, but I think they've got a really tough job. This, I mean, can they really win? Somebody's going to be put out by whichever way they go with this, aren't they? So I think we have yeah. to just kind of accept. I, I just want... I'm happy for questions to still be left open, but not too many. Yeah, I think I agree. I think that there, there will be room for, certainly in the books, I've gone on record many times as saying that even when all the show and the books are finished, we are still going to be arguing about who Azora High reborn was, if anybody. Um, and I think that that's definitely the 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 leaving the questions is actually just a part of good art because you don't have to tie everything up so yeah i think that there will be some things left there it's about the ending of the character arc so it feels satisfying um, um some really good suggestions in the chat um karma police 20 220 says danny finds her red door and it fades to black Oh, Eric, love it. Eric Trask says, no throne at the end, a democracy is formed. That's how you break the wheel. Yeah, lots of really great suggestions. Yeah, I think the the Iron Throne being destroyed is, if I had to pick an ending, that would probably be pretty close to what it is, because it's that this has been the thing that they have consistently from the very beginning been uh, bigging up as what this is about. It's the battle for the throne. The hashtag that they've had for the final season is for the throne, uh, which has always jarred with me because it's mm -hmm. like, actually, at this point, it's not for the throne. This is about for survival. Um, so I think that they're wanting us to, and the, the new title sequence, uh, which we'll talk a bit more about in just a moment, uh, the new title sequence does end with a shot of the Iron Throne. So right. they're wanting us to be thinking about that still. Uh, and I think that having that be destroyed is a, a hugely symbolic way of showing that this is things have moved on, things are going to be different from now. Um, the reason why uh, we had a super chat from Jeff Burst. Hi, Jeff, uh, one of my uh, longtime patrons, um, saying, hey, Robert, do you think that the Isle of Faces being included now in the credits means something? Now, actually, this is one of those times when... Uh, before we go live, we always, the, the, the people doing live streams, we have a very quick chat, just catch up on what's going on in life, mock Gemma's jumper choice, things like that. Uh, but one of the things that we did this time was um, talk about the credit, the, 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 the title sequence, and specifically this very issue about the Isle of Faces being included, because it is very specifically included in a way that it wasn't before. What what do you make of that? I'll, I'll just leave it as an open question there. So, because uh, Jeff asked it as an open question, what what does it mean? Oh goodness me! 
um, I um, started my my episode breakdown and thought, well, I'll obviously I'll start with the opening credits. And then I wrote about two and a half thousand words on the opening credits alone and thought, OK, that's a standalone video. Um, yeah, we we were shown so much, but so little in the opening credits. Well, you know, normally we're taken to um, maybe six, seven, sometimes eight different locations. We were shown the wall, specifically Eastwatch. We were shown the last half. We were shown very, very briefly the Isle of Faces, Winterfell, obviously, and King's Landing. So the locations have been narrowed down. And also that the pathway now goes from north to south, in, whereas before it went up to the wall. Um, we did mention um, at the very beginning of this discussion, actually, LML's theory that's on his channel regarding Weirwoods and the Night King and the symbolism that su surrounds the uh, Ned Umber that we saw at the end of the episode. Um, I believe that those locations that we see on the map now in the new credits are the path that the Night King and his army are going to take. So he maybe has a very specific reason to go, particularly, if not briefly, to the Isle of Faces. What for? I could speculate on for days, but we don't have time <laughs> for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I agree with that. Certainly in the, the broad strokes of it. Just uh, Jojo Lady Dane, first of all, thank you as, as one of the many moderators today. Thank you to all the moderators. She's telling me to lay off on your jumper. So I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was, uh, it's it's in, in, entirely fair. It's only because right right here, right now, I'm feeling very hot. Uh, and uh, uh, and Gemma's there in her woolly jumper. And it's just, I, I wish I was as feeling cold as she apparently is. Um, uh, but um, yeah, in terms of the title sequence, my I, my take is exactly the same as yours. I think they're going to change it every episode. Yeah. They are showing where the action is taking place. They are showing in Winterfell. We saw the the room where the sort of the big the council room, either the Great Hall. I don't know what the official name for it is. They're showing the crypts. So I think we we certainly seen action in both of those places. Um, we see. I the thing I found most intriguing was the inclusion of. The underneath in the Red Keep where you had the scorpion and the the uh, Balerion's, the dragon Balerion's skull. If you remember back from last season, that's where Kyburn developed it and showed its power in shooting a dragon. I think this hints that there is going to be scorpion action once more this season and possibly even uh, killing a dragon over or shooting down a dragon over King's Landing. I think that's a strong hint of that. In terms of the Isle of Faces, yes, there's also somebody, uh, Eagle Eyed, pointed out to me that it's linked. If you actually do a quick freeze frame on it, it's linked to the mainland, so it's actually not an island on the pre credits show, in the, 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 the title sequence. I think it's easy to read too much into that mm -hmm. um, because it is quite a low on detail kind of map of Westeros. But yes, my interpretation is that this probably means that they are, at the very least, going to show us the Isle of Faces. Um, uh, we may not get action there, they've not mentioned it, so I think it's getting to the point where they have to start mentioning things that are important, otherwise uh, we don't have the right amount of build-up to them. They, they haven't mentioned it, and therefore I think they're probably not going to make it a major part of what's going on. Uh, but they have got a strong track record of nodding at the camera for things that are important in the books that they're not going to do much on in the show, yeah. like the the Sword Dawn, uh, they lingered on that, like the Horn of Winter, they, they looked, showed that for a little bit. Uh, they've mentioned Howland Reed a couple of times in passing. So the important characters and places and things in the books, they often just show us and then move on as if to say, we know these are important, but we're just not covering that in the show. So it might be that, but if they start name checking the Isle of Faces, then yeah, it's it's on guys. Uh, but the, the thing that they've been focusing on as the sort of the magical center is more where the Night King, the Weirwood, the, with the Standing Stones, where the Night King was formed and that, as far as we can tell, 
is north of the wall. So that, if anywhere, is where this kind of focus is going to be rather than the Isle of Faces. But perhaps they'll say that that is on the Isle of Faces and we'll all get very confused about where the geography of yeah. things. I, I think um, you might be right, though. I, I think it's quite possible because... They, they haven't built this up. They haven't, I think if any, I mean, to give us a mysterious and magical location, that would work. But I think if somebody, you know, non-book readers, people that have only ever watched the show, for them to suddenly introduce all of the lore and everything that surrounds the Isle of Faces would be a bit jarring um, because they haven't built it up. They haven't explained this prior at any point. Um, so maybe it is uh, another well-received book nod. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, let's go back to Sam. We were talking about Sam and John earlier on uh, in the stream and, and how Sam clearly was in a very emotional moment when he just learned about how Danny had killed his parents, oh, sorry, his, his dad and his brother. Uh, and then when he tells John about uh, who his parents really were, he seemed to have an agenda. He was immediately pushing him to uh, to be... Uh, comparing himself to Danny, saying that he'd be a better monarch than Danny. Um, and we had a question from uh, Licardo Guira saying, do you think Sam will plot to put John on the throne like he did to make John Lord Commander? <laughs> this is a really interesting question because John did not put himself forward to be Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. This was Sam doing things effectively behind his back, thinking that he'd be great and therefore putting him in, and he won. It... It seems like the same, you're right, I would agree that it seems like the same kind of build up to this in that Sam is clearly convinced that John is the best person for the job and he's clearly convinced that he is the person who is rightfully the king. Therefore, he is always going to be on Team John. The, the question is, is he going to be trying to coordinate something? What, what do you think, Gemma? Do you think there's a chance that he might try and manipulate people, try and get gather people around as a supporters of John as king? Well, the hilarious thing is, is John hasn't put himself forward for anything. And the second he loses a title, he immediately gains an even more higher ranking one. Um, we saw this with the Lord Commander. He dropped that. Then he was king of the north. And now he's dropped that. Now he's the king of the seven kingdoms, apparently. And um, I think there's a really good chance. I'm not sure if Sam will be manipulative, per se, if this was something he sought out to do. Um, but people seem to listen to Sam. He doesn't, he's one of those people, you know, those people that don't speak up very often, but when they do, their words are very carefully chosen, they're very well thought through. And I think people put a lot of stock in what Sam says because they know that he's a learned man and he speaks the truth, he's honest, he's loyal, he's dedicated. And I think when Sam speaks, people stop and listen. And we saw that with the um lord commander um putting john forward so maybe that was a setting up of sam becoming some king maker yeah i think so i think that whether he actually tries to make it happen or whether he just finds himself in a group of people like for example Tyrion and varus i think will have a big judgment call to make um, if they discover that John is the rightful king, because Tyrion clearly rates John. Um, Varys clearly has some concerns about Danny. They may well want to go over that way. Certainly a whole load of the Northern Lords would probably prefer him to Daenerys. So immediately you've got a whole group of people who might do that. The question is who, who would be, well, two questions. The first, who would be the ringleader there? I suspect... Sam probably isn't, he's not really a leader type. Um, uh, the, but the second question, as you very rightly say, is what what does John think about this? Does well, he yeah. even want it? I suspect I suspect he probably doesn't. I suspect he just thinks, no, I, why on earth would I want to be king? Uh, every time I've got something, I've decided to push it to one side. Oh, this isn't what I'm wanting. Um, so I think that that is probably it's going to be a matter of people pushing for John on his behalf, even when he doesn't particularly want it himself. Um, Jeff Burst, uh, just very quickly, I spotted in the uh, the chat you were saying about the 
uh, the the location of the where the Night King was created, uh, that there was the that uh, dagger shaped or arrowhead shaped mountain in the background, which is the same one that the Hound saw in the vision, and it's the same one that uh, we saw a little bit of the action north of the wall in episode six of last season. So yes, that, that's why I was saying we'd all get a little bit confused about geography because they they it clearly set that up to be there. They didn't say it was there when that happened. Uh, but that seems to be the implication of what it was because they very obviously showed us the same ma uh, mountain in the background. Um, we've got a couple of questions about Kyburn. Uh, people are loving the Kyburn questions today. Um, Lucas uh, Giorgio says, do you think people overlook Kyburn's rise in power? And Jojo Lady Dane says, will Kyburn reanimate Cersei when she dies? Uh, so, uh, uh, Jojo, first, uh, thank you to you and all of the moderators. You're doing a fantastic job there. You've been seeing it as we've been going through. Uh, you always do, but really, you, you're the unsung stars of uh, of not just this channel, but a lot of channels in the community. So, uh, guys, if you're watching this live in the chat, could you send some love to the moderators? But uh, we've got a couple of questions. Do people overlook Kyburn's rise to power? Yes, I think they do. I think that they just assume that he's just part of it and then forget that he worked his own way up. And in terms of whether Kyburn will reanimate Cersei when she dies, I personally think not. Uh, I, I, there, there's some hints in the books that potentially that maybe she could be, but I think that in the show she is going to be right up to the nearly the very end. I think she's going to be uh, still alive up to the last um, episode um, and then she will be killed uh, but I think as I said earlier I think Kyburn will scarper rather than try and uh, fight what is very clearly by that point a losing battle but what, what do you think Gemma do you think that she might be resurrected again by Kyburn? No I don't think so um, I think it's very interesting that we've never really um, had a discussion or a, a point where we could question Kyburn's loyalties per se and yet suddenly in the last episode he does make a point of telling Bronn what Cersei has given him um, but as far, far as Cersei herself I think we may reach a point like you said very close towards the end where we might actually be thinking goodness me is she going to outlive them all and I, and I think we're going to get very close to the wire with Cersei I do believe she will die but I think we will be wondering, is she just going to outlive everybody and end up on the Iron Throne? I think there's going to be a moment of worry as far as Cersei goes. Yeah, I think so. The the Her plan is effectively for this anyway. She's basically, she's saying, well, you go off and fight things up mm -hmm. in the north. I'm just going to sit down here. So as far as I'm concerned, that gives her a free pass all the way through to episode four, yeah. is that there's there's no, nobody's even thinking about coming and attacking her yet. So... I think that, that that the action will then move down from the north to King's Landing. And I think it's the, the, that they have to have some sort of big final thing. I know they've been bigging up episode three, but that's because they've been, yes, it's going to be a huge battle, but that's also because they've hidden everything or almost everything about the last three episodes they've done an incredibly tight job on this almost all if not all of the footage in the trailer the pre-season trailers was from the first three episodes yeah. the last three we know very very little about and i i have to admit i uh I, i'm more excited by episode four onwards than i was for episode one uh because i felt as we were talking earlier i felt as if i knew quite a lot of things that things that were going to ha happen because they had to happen right the company had to arrive uh john and danny had to arrive in winterfell yeah happening there um let's uh go to jc saying whites are vulnerable to fire both whites and white walkers die with a scratch from dragonglass, so aren't white aren't the white walkers incredibly vulnerable? Um, well, yes, is the short answer. They are incredibly vulnerable to some things. Uh, the quest, the fact about um, 
uh, Valyrian steel, which you're, you're not really mentioning there, but there aren't many Valyrian steel blades out, so that's something in their favour. Uh, but uh, Dragonglass there is now a lot up in the north, and I think that we'll see a lot of the the army with Dragonglass tipped weapons going on. Uh, but what, how do you think this uh, will affect? I mean, again, this is something else we were talking about actually before we went live. How do you think this will affect how the battle itself will turn out? this clear vulnerability to some big things. Yeah, right now, the Night King is incredibly OP, isn't he? And, and that's the point, you know what we need to have? We need to be at a point where we're thinking, how are they possibly going to get out of this? That's what creates the tension in story writing when we get to this climactic point in any story. Um, yes, the whites are vulnerable to fire, but so are humans. So they might want to be careful about liberally distributing fire all over the place. Um, I, I think we might see the Night King being taken down a little bit um, prior to the main battle or maybe during the main battle at some point. I think Arya has an extremely important role to play. But in a lot of the trailers that we've seen, like you said, most of them seem to be from the first three episodes, um, Winterfell does appear in several of the shots to be ablaze. Maybe they've done that on purpose. Maybe that was an accidental dragon thing. Who knows? Um, but like I said, the living are just as vulnerable to fire as the dead. So if they had to burn Winterfell to survive, then they have no home anymore. So that's an issue. Yeah. I I agree. It's uh, so so they are vulnerable, but then humans are also vulnerable. It's going it's it's going to get messy. Is basically yeah. the answer here. <laughs> uh, so it's um, I I certainly see it's that it seems to be starting out. They've got a, a, what looks like a trebuchet from the trailer for uh, episode two. I certainly imagine that being filled with something flaming, possibly some dragon glass, but I think f flames would work better. And that going out into the army of the dead, I can see, um, I'm sure I've seen a shot in one of the trailers of the uh, the Unsullied with uh, dragon glass around their shields and things like that. So they're going to go out, try and take the battle to them. But then some of the Unsullied Dothraki die, they will get raised again, and then the, the balance of power will shift once more. So it's going to be very to and fro. Uh, but the, the question will be what happens when they get inside the walls. Once they right. get inside the walls, it gets really quite difficult because that's the point at which actually having a dragon, and we've got, we've got a question on this in just a moment, having a dragon isn't so much of an advantage if all of your guys are in hand-to-hand -hand combat with all of their guys. Exactly. Because the whole point about the dragons is that they can just sort of mow down with, with the, just this uh, flamethrower all the way through a whole army. But if the armies are right up close, you can't because you could just be burning anybody on the ground. Um, I said we had a question here. So uh, Didier Mwanza uh, says, uh, hey, Robert and Secrets, a question. What if the Night King doesn't show up at Winterfell? He wants to overrun them. Uh, he wants them overrun and leave Winterfell, leaving Bran exposed. So, do you think that the Night King will turn up at Winterfell first? Yes, I think he will. I think he will maybe turn up in advance and do a little flyby, a little recce of the situation, and then maybe try to go back to his troops if a certain faceless assassin lets that one slide. Yes, so uh, I think I agree. I think he is going to be there. I think that he is um, he's going to try and focus in on Bran. I think he definitely sees him as a threat. He knows that he's got a lot of magic going on. So uh, I think that that's, that's where he's going to get into it. Would he leave his army to go off and do his dirty work? I, I don't think so. He doesn't seem... We don't get huge amounts about his character, but he seems to be quite a frontline kind of guy, really, if anything. Yeah. He seems to be, uh, when there's the assault on Blood Raven's Cave, he's right there among it. Hard uh, Home. When hard Home, the, 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 the battle right up to episode six, North of the Wall, he was, he was there throwing the spears. He was the person doing the things. 
Uh, I, so I don't think we're going to see him just sitting back and watching from afar. I think he's going to be involved in the action. Linda Prestula says, after the Night King stops for tacos. <laughs> <laughs> you say it so wonderfully, tacos. Um, uh, Linda Prestula, thank you so much for your very generous uh, super chat. Do you think that Sam will see Aya with the cat's paw dagger and remember he saw it in one of the books. Also, Gemma looks beautiful in her outfit. She does, she does. I'm, I'm feeling very bad uh, for, for mocking it earlier. Um, it's it's a very nice job. Um, Thank you. So do you think Sam will see Arya with the cat's paw dagger and remember he saw it in one of the books? He did when he was down, if you remember way back in last season when he was down in the Citadel, um, it was there a picture of the dagger uh, and then there were sort of words along the side which basically said that the ancient Valyrians used dragon glass as sort of ornament, uh, ornamentation, they used it on uh, hilts of weapons and things like that. Um, so will if does will he see Aya and recognise it? Uh, I mean I think my take is that he might but if he does then I don't think that it's actually going to make a huge difference because it it is although yes it's got what we now give it a cool name the cat's paw dagger then that's it that's it's not its real name it if it had a real mm. name we we don't know what it was we don't know any of the history of it the only thing is that it happened to have been sort of as far as we can tell in the king's armory and that was just one of the things that was just hanging around that seems to be the backstory to it um, so yes, Sam might, but there wasn't a thing in that book that said, and this is a really important bit of uh, Valyrian steel kit. Uh, he would probably look at it and go, huh, that's really useful because that is both Valyrian steel and dragon glass. You could attack with both ends of that. But I mean, do you, do you think that there's something more there that I'm missing? I don't think more, no. I think um, it could be an opportunity for Sam to, like you said, drop a little bit of history. Um, the history that we understand is in the book, it appears to have been Joffrey that took it from Robert's armory and gave to the Cat's Poor Assassin. In the show, they are saying that it was Littlefinger's dagger all along. Um, it, it's vague. Um, but obviously, before that, it clearly belonged to a Targaryen or somebody in ancient Valeria as the book would suggest. So yeah, it might be a, um, a cool little, another a, a book nod perhaps, um, just like a little, it would be a sentence, it would be a drop. Oh, that did you know that belonged to insert famous Valerian dragon lord here kind of situation? Yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that there's a specific thing attached to it. There's not like a special power or anything there. Um, but yeah, he might well recognise it, uh, but I don't think it's going to take any extra importance. What I'm more intrigued by is whether or not that thing that she was designing, is that like a holder for it, that she can have a staff and then a detachable bit at the end that turns into her cat's ball dagger. That, that's what it looked like to me. I don't know. She's got, as we've discussed, she's going to have all the weapons. Uh, so she's got the, the the bow and arrow as well we saw in the trailer. She's got this staff thing she's designed. She's got needles. She's got a cat's ball dagger. She's just like a one woman killing machine at the moment. So, um, Susan Dunkel, uh, thank you. Saying thank you both so much for adding to my enjoyment of a truly special experience. Without your personal body of works over the years, I would not have enjoyed Get Game of Thrones the way I do now. That would have been a shame. Cheers. Thank you, Susan. I, uh, I, I'm sure Gemma does as well. I really appreciate it. I, I, it's really weird doing this thing, just talking to my computer um, to understand the sort of the impacts and when people say stuff like that, that it's, it's, um, it's really touching and it means a lot to me. So thank you. Um, Eric. Lucifer means light bringers on point, by the way. I just thought I would mention that. He, oh. I, he let me chuckle and he knew it was at him. And it was. <laughs> um, okay, I was having a touching moment there and then LML interve intervenes again. This is, uh, <laughs> he, even when I don't invite him on my stream, he's in the he's, he's He in still the manages shade. to interrupt you. <laughs> he does, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, anyway, I'll just, I just, I live with that. This is, this is all good. Um, 
Eric de Trask says, shouldn't the reeds not being at Winterfell be viewed as bad as the Glovers not showing? All Northern houses should be there. Uh, what's your take? And hi, Gemma. He says, well, as he says, hi, Gemma, I shall pass it over to, to Gemma. Do you think House Reed should be there? Yeah, uh, they should. And hi, by the way. Um, yeah, they, I mean, they, they were told to hold the neck. This was, they didn't ignore House Reed um, during the War of the Five Kings. You know, Rob Stark spoke about them and and, and the, the orders that he'd sent out. They are a very important house as far as their strategic location goes. Um, Amira's, it feels that that's it. That that was it, that, that ignominious exit that she which was awful um awful in terms of how terrible for mira not that the show is awful and not at all um just that that was really hard to watch after everything she'd been through i don't know if they're just ignoring i mean house reed is a northern house that's a very low down northern house but nonetheless it is still a northern house um so they're, they're bannermen of the starks that just haven't been mentioned it would have been nice if somebody had said you know we've sent word to the reeds they're going to hold the neck if winterfell falls maybe that will be discussed in a strategy kind of situation in episode two yeah i think um yes they should be there i agree unless they've been given special dispensation not to and it kind of makes sense that they might have been because they are specialists. They are, they're not fighters. They're not the, the people who fight in big battles. They are specialists at defending the neck, which is an, a, a unique uh, type of, uh, of land within Westeros. Uh, so it would make sense that if the Starks are doing some forward thinking, they might go, you know what, if Winterfell does fall, we want to protect the rest of Westeros. The next place after this that we want to do a battle or we want to uh, sort of uh, create some sort of a bottleneck is the neck. So it, it would make sense to me if they had been given that dispensation, but we haven't heard that they have yet. So that's where I'm at uh, with that one, it has to be said. Um, I, like, I, I, I like the idea that they have, uh, if only because I got a soft spot for House Reed. Hmm. Um, so uh, Jeremiah Matthews says, has anyone talked about a Hodor situation concerning the, uh, this is the Maid King here, I assume that's the Night King. Um, not entirely sure I understand that one, particularly if you're saying whether Hodor is going to be uh, made into a white and we see him, I think that's that's actually quite possible. They will definitely be showing us a few familiar faces uh, in, in the Army of the Dead just, and out of all of, the one, all of them, the one I think which would hit me the most is Hodor because uh, having spent his entire life having to, effectively having to relive his death then having to spend his entire undeath actually attacking the place where it was his home that would be absolutely horrific um did did you have any thoughts about hodor Gemma? I, i'm 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 with you that that would be tough to watch um but this is game of thrones if any show's going to break our hearts twice over um it would be them um and of course you know locationally and situationally how hodor died there is a very real possibility that that could happen um but i think hodor maybe not sure could happen but i think as far as the cast of characters that we see right now there's gonna be some whites made of some really beloved characters i believe yeah, I think I think it's pretty inevitable, to be honest. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Coop says, what do you think the symbols on the rock in the rock formations in episode one, season one, have to do with the story during the beheading of the Night's Watchman? Um, okay, so I, this is yeah. this is we're getting back to. Do, do you have an answer on this one, Gemma? Um, in the books, that's an ironwood stump. That, that's pretty much all I've got, really. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, my my uh, big take on this is that the um, 
the showrunners have sort of admitted that they uh, they came up with how the whole thing was going to end somewhere around season four or five. Um, at which point it had become apparent that they weren't going to get the books, so they actually had to get something themselves, work out the broad brushstrokes. They had a conversation with George R. R. Martin, and they sort of went from there. Um, now, what that means, I think, is that early on, particularly with stuff that with episode one, which was it was a pilot to start with, they weren't doing all the forward planning about what all the symbols and things might mean. They're just trying to adapt the books at that point and try and make something which can survive more than a season. So my take is that the symbols that you get in season one aren't as worked up or as thought through uh, and therefore they haven't got the same resonances as we we see with later symbols, which is why when you see in episode one, when the bodies are arranged right in the first scene, the bodies are arranged in the snow, they're in a different pattern with the sort of the circle with the line going through it, um, which they kind of give a little nod to in a similar pattern being one of the ones up on the, the, the in the cave paintings uh, over on Dragonstone, but clearly they've decided that the the pattern that the White Walkers are using and are creating now is the swirly one. That's the one that they're focusing on. So I would I would personally say is that, that don't pay too much attention to the symbolism of things that happened in that first episode or, or season or so in terms of the end game, uh, only in as much as stuff that are in the books as well. Uh, so, so that's where my take on that one would be. Yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. I don't think it's until kind of when we see the horse caught the corpses, the mutilated horse bodies, that's the first spiral that we see. And like you said, that seems to be the predominant one. So again, I'm with you. Excellent. Good. Love it when we agree. Um, <laughs> and Will, thank you very much for the super chat saying, just wanted to say from uh, hi from Atlanta, uh, you'll kill it on every video and live chat. Thank you so much. Also, tell Gemma I love your sweater. Um, <laughs> the sweater talk's been... <laughs> <laughs> Gemma, I love your sweater. Um, can, we now, can, can we now call it on the sweater talk? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a lovely jumper. It's um, not Iron Man and it's not Varys the Spider. It's not Game of Thrones related. This is not a sigil. This is uh, Wonder Woman. Um, Wonder Woman. This is a Spider Woman. Um, it's a it's a Marvel top. Just just to clarify, because the conversation about my sweater has been entirely disproportionate. Um, it, it it has. Although um, I I want to, I'm going to as my gift as you were talking about Avengers as uh, my gift to the world. Someone said it to me, and I'm still trying to find a way to work it into the conversation. Uh, somebody come up with a clever way of putting together Avengers Endgame and Game of Thrones to be End Game of Thrones. It, okay. it needs to happen somehow as a hashtag or something. It's just too good not to be. Um, this year is going to be a big sad year for a lot of people in terms of ending of franchises. Not this, these ones, but also Star Wars Episode Nine. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see over the course of the next two or three years, slightly getting away from Game of Thrones here, over the course of the next two or three years, how the big studios and, and uh, the channels and things like that are trying to fill the void to create the next huge franchises. And we're going to see that in things like Lord of the Rings, for example, um, as well as obviously Marvel carrying on with their the next phase of their world domination plans. Um, but let's get back to Game of Thrones. Um, Dorn Dornish Dan, the common people lost... High Septon, Sept of Baylor, Marjorie the Good, and their hope. Now the army of the dead approaches, and all know Cersei uh, is a biatch. Uh, time for revolution, uh, tumbrils and guillotines. So yeah, this is. I, I, I like where this this thinking is. Is that George R. R. Martin very clearly um, plays up the fact that this is a story which is being told through the eyes of the privileged few, the rich, the lords, the ladies, and all the rest of it. Very, very few of the characters we see uh, are just normal folks. Um, but he plays up the fact of the impact on 
the normal people out in the world. Um, and they've they've shown it less on the show, but they've shown it a little bit there. This really is something, the course of what's happened here is something which has affected everybody, not just a few characters who've died, but uh, if this were real world stuff, then there's entire communities being uprooted. There's, there's a generation has been killed off. We've had disease wiping loads of people out. All, all sorts of terrible and horrific things are happening. And actually the characters that we see that we think of as going through so much, they're probably more protected from all of this than the people that the, that uh, work for them, their soldiers who just have to do stuff uh, obey orders and do the things that they're told to do uh, and don't have any control over it. The characters that we see are the ones who have some sort of control. But how do you see that kind of tension between the the characters that we see and the small folk as a whole? How do you see that playing out? Do you think that this might lead to some sort of small folk rebellion? Um, well, we've, we've seen this and we did discuss the riots at King's Land, Landing, didn't we, earlier, and Sansa and being practical and logistical and, and trying to make sure that they're well cared for as well as they can be, um, given everything that's happening. This is one of the reasons why I enjoyed Arya's chapters in um, Clash so much, because she is, um, as you said, not many of the characters give us an insight into the plight of the small folk, but Arya's chapters um, throughout that second book definitely do, because we see her, you know, trying to make her way north and she ends up at Harrenhal and, and those chapters are really dark and, and intense and difficult to read at points, but we really do get like that on the ground point of view, that perspective of what's going on. And while we've got all these people arguing over who has what title and who sits on what chair um as it stands you know sounds as thinking about the small folk long term but john's concern right now is that's if any of them are even still alive we kind of have to deal with this problem before food is even a consideration ultimately we kind of maybe worry about that after we've established if anybody's still alive shall we yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, Marcus Aurelius, um, great name, says, do you think there could be any revelations about the crypts of Winterfell that could be book spoilers? Will they have any significance in the coming battle? I think for me, the answer is no. Uh, I think that in the books, the crypts are hugely important. I think that this is what that they are the embodiment of Starkishness. I think that this is where all the old Starks, the dead Starks, are being effectively uh, held prisoner, to, awaiting to be freed uh, to fight for uh, the the living, as it were. Um, I think that that is what the whole purpose is. I've done videos on this. If you want to go check them out, uh, the I would probably refer you to one called uh, The Horn of Winter and the Crypts of Winterfell, um, just to get my thinking about that as a whole. But the main thing there is that, that it is shown time and time again when people go down there, it's almost, it's anthropomorphized that people feel as if the dead Starks are there, just yeah. like ghosts. And it's a very, very different feeling to in on the show. Yes, this is the place where Jon Snow goes to brood and things like that. <laughs> it's a very Starkish place, but there's not been any hint that um, there's this kind of extra layer going on there, that Winterfell is some kind of hugely magical place. That if any dead Starks are raised, I personally suspect that they will be by the Night King to fight on his side sure. rather than by uh, the, the, the Starks to fight on their side. But what, what do you think about the the crypt is there is there an extra level or not perhaps well, yeah. is there an extra level <laughs> but is there is, is, is there an extra sort of thematic thing going on there on the show that, that, that is going to be revealed here no i don't think so i think it's quite clear that the crypts are going to be important in this final season um and i think that's going to ultimately come down as a place to hide a place to brood and perhaps where a last stand in winterfell is made 
Um, the books are going to be a, a much, much deeper. That that the show just doesn't does not have the time to discuss ironwood doors and swords laid across laps in that denial of guest right position and the like you said the animation that we see from the statues the way that they are staring and the dreams that the Starks have about the crypts and all that fun stuff. Um, I do think the quips will be important in the show, but I think there's the the other level that we're talking about, not of the quips of of the meaning and and the purpose, will be much deeper in the books because there is far more scope and time to do that. Yeah, I th I think that's right. It's that it, they will they will be important, but not as important yes. as in the books. Um, so, Linda Prasuta, thank you again. A very generous super chat. What do you think Danny's rest of her sentence was going to be? This is in episode one, uh, when she was telling John that if Sansa uh, can't, mm. oh, sorry, if Sansa can't respect her, then she got interrupted with the dragons, uh, a barely eating scene. Uh, do you have, you, you were sort of uh, uh, nodding <laughs> to that. Do you, do you have an answer to that one? They've, they've been cutting off conversations halfway through a lot, haven't they? And it's getting a bit frustrating. Maybe she was just kind of saying to John, well, sort it out then, you know, go and have a word with your sister. Because then we did see a scene later where John does go and speak to Sansa and then Sansa just lays a load of shade on John. And then that conversation gets cut off before we get to see John answering Sansa's question, did you bend the knee because you're in love with her again? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I think this is just playing up again. I don't think we actually need to know the end of this. I think it's just playing up again, this this tension between uh, Danny and pretty much everybody in the North when she arrives there. So I think that's it. And it's, it's this hint of uh, what would she do if Sansa doesn't respect her? Well, I don't think she's going to turn around and burn her. But, you know, that it's it's a it's a question is that if Danny says that she is the queen of the seven kingdoms and then one of the ruling lords just refuses to obey her, then what does a king nor a queen normally do? So that is a question. But this is all going to be brushed to one side when the army of the dead arrive. It's not going to be a long. This is just building up the tensions that we're going to see in the second or played out in the second half of the season. We did see maybe some kind of parallels to this in Fire and Blood when Queen Alysanne goes to the north and receives a fairly frosty reception, but she manages to warm the uh, the Lord of Winterfell eventually. So maybe that's kind of a thing. Yes, yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm, There's obviously a link across her, so keep your queen warm then, or whatever a cheesy line it was that Danny came out with in episode one. Um, uh, <laughs> Always Blazon1369, thank you so much for the super chat. I don't see a question, but thank you, that's very kind. Um, Jeremiah Matthews um, says, uh, we know Brandon caused uh, Hodor's condition. Could he have caused the Mad King to go insane? Um, yeah, so this is this is an idea for those who haven't come across it. I've, I've sort of played around with it a couple of times um, that... Uh, we, with the Mad King, we see that he didn't start off mad, he got mad during his life. And on the show, it's not exactly the same in the books, but on the show, he's clearly just repeating the same phrase over and over again, burn them all, burn them all, which is very reminiscent of this kind of thing that Hodor uh, was obviously saying, uh, burn them all, hold the door. It's got the same kind of rhythm to it. So it's very tempting to think that perhaps, particularly as it's uh, the kind of thing that you might expect someone like Bran or Blood Raven to try and talk to the king to tell them about the threat of the White Walkers or something uh, when it was still a long way away, that, um, that maybe they tried to do that and it just went wrong. So I like the theory of this. I suspect that they're not going to go into it on the show in the books i think it's possible but it's more likely of anything to be blood raven who did it rather than bran um but do you do you subscribe to this uh, theory? i don't i don't think it's a tinfoil theory i think it's no. it's a potential uh, uh, way of of these things happening but it's uh, it's the thing we haven't got any evidence for yet but do you do you think it makes sense to you honestly robert you you nailed that 
um, it's very rare that I don't have something to say, but I, <laughs> I I could not add to that because you literally covered all the bullet points that were running through my mind there. So I think we should move on. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, in that case, we should get on to one of my other favourite subjects, which is the uh, the Horn of Winter. Jeffrey Burst again, thank you so much. Uh, do you think that the horn Sam found at the Fist of the First Men will show up? So this is... I think it's going to be this, uh, another example of, of what I was talking about earlier. We were talking about when we were saying that the show often gives a little nod to uh, things that are important in the books, but that they're not going to pick up on. And so the the horn that was there that they showed, there was this cache of dragon glass and a horn. They showed it for a bit. They didn't really major on it. And then they've not done it again. In my mind, that means that that's going to play no part now because then they're not suddenly going to go, oh, yeah, I remember we found this horn ages ago um, and uh, I wonder what happens if we blow it. Wow, magically things have that. That's not if that were going to happen, they would have flagged it up a little bit at some point in the yeah, interceding five or six seasons or something like that. So I don't think it is. I think in the books it is going to be very important um, they keep on talking about it, mentioning that Sam has got it in the books every every book or so. That there's just like a mention. Even he, when he goes off to stops off at Bravos, then uh, he has to effectively sell all of his things, and it very pointedly says he's only got the clothes on his back and that old horn. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so yeah, clearly he's still got it, even when he had to get rid of absolutely everything else. Uh, and I think it will be quite important in books but on the show no i don't think so but what, what do you think do you think they're going to surprise us by bringing this back no um I, I there's many horns in the books um there's the horn of winter there's the horn of joraman um victorian greyjoy has a a dragon horn apparently um who knows that, that i think there's mention of a kraken horn there's all sorts of horns going on um they, they it appears that they did this with a few things they kind of set up potentially an avenue and then certain avenues were dropped. They set up um, the Taisha Avenue at one point and that was clearly dropped in Tyrion's storyline. Um, and, and that, so, so the horn again, it was maybe just, we're not sure if we're gonna go that route or not. So we'll just pop it there just in case. But how many seasons has it been now? three, four, since we've seen the horn, it would be a bit weird to just suddenly whip it out and it'd be the magical answer to everything. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, uh, Thomas Bingham saying question below. Thanks again, guys, first class, thank you. Um, I think I found that question uh, saying, any importance in the last two Three-Eyed Ravens being from House Targaryen and Stark is this more evidence that John is the ultimate chess piece in this story as he shares ancestry from both? Um, well, I will, Gemma, for those who don't know, is is our resident expert on the genealogies of, <laughs> uh, of uh, this this world. She she owns the what I consider to be the definitive family tree of Westeros. So I'll throw to her in just a moment. I will just pick up on this, though, first to say that uh, Bloodraven, as Gemma, I'm sure, will tell us in greater detail, Although, yes, he's Targaryen, he's half Blackwood, which means he's half uh, First Men stock. Um, and uh, so he's not, we, we've not got just a Targaryen and then just a you know, pure Targaryen and a pure stock. John, however, yes, I think that he is important. And the fact that his parentage is Stark and Targaryen is important. This is the, uh, the Song of Ice and Fire. This is about ice and fire. We've got the uh, the ice symbolizing the, the the White Walkers, the Night King, also the sort of the Starkish side. We've got fire with the Targaryens, with the dragons, and in the middle of it all, we've got John, who is this kind of pivot balance character who represents both ice and fire. So yes, he is central to all of this. That doesn't mean that he's like this great hero who's going to conquer everything and do everything wonderfully, but he is thematically central to it all. But just in terms of sort of the genealogy, is there anything you want to sort of add in on that? Yeah, um, Maester Zen 
um, has, has got the truth of it in the chat. Um, he says the Blackwoods are the secret house of ice and fire. Um, you mentioned obviously Blood Raven's mother was a Blackwood, um, and we know the Blackwoods are in the Targaryen line, but they are also very prominent in the Stark line. Ned Stark's grandmother, I believe it was. I don't have my family tree right in front of me. Couldn't possibly remember all 900 names on that and locate them um, at a, without actually having a glance over. I know Ned. Ned's mother was Liara Stark, and I believe it was his grandmother was a Blackwood. So that means John has Blackwood on both the Targaryen and the Stark side. And as you correctly said, Blackwood is old men, first men stock. Um, so I believe that this kind of walking, green seeing, old gods kind of magic thing isn't necessarily a Stark thing. It's either a Blackwood thing, but more likely a first men Thing, and that seems to be very strong in the Blackwood vein. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the interesting thing, perhaps, if you could just go off from that uh, to talk about the the lineage of the prince that was promised, uh, which we think of as being that this is supposedly coming from uh, purely Targaryen stock. We're told that this has to come down from the uh, the line of uh, Eris and Rhaella, but Actually, if you go back a generation, then that means that they are also half Blackwood again. Is that right? Yes. Exactly. Good. So I think what we're looking at is that the Targaryens are not, it gets a little bit confusing, but they're not pure Targaryen. Uh, it's, it's, uh, that's, that's my conclusion from all of this. But symbolically, John is the balance. He is ice and fire. So yes, he is... He is uh, a or the central character in, in all of this. Doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be victorious and, and end up as this kind of Aragorn character, but it does mean that he's central to it all. Right. Eric de, de Trask says, if John's lineage is revealed, wouldn't Sansa like that, as she could remain Lady of Winterfell and have the ear of the king, thus he would be out of her way. Yeah, I think this is an interesting one. So um, I don't know whether she would like it. I, I, I'm, I think she would just like, okay, fine, that's that's how it is. We'll move on from there. I think she definitely is enjoying being the Lady of Winterfell. I don't think there's there's any doubt about that. Uh, so if she ends up being the Lady of Winterfell um, and someone else is sitting on the Iron Throne, I think she'd be very happy. I think that's exactly where it would work out. But they sansa and john on the show in particular yes there might have been some tensions but they do get on they are on the same side so i don't think that she's there going to be sort of politicking about where she is and where john is i think that certainly on the show they're both on the same team but what would you what would you read into this well how do you think sansa will react to the news whenever it gets to her that John actually isn't her half brother is a whole lot more complicated than that. <laughs> um, I, I think all of the Starks. I mean, I think we can include Arya in this as well. Obviously, Bran already knows. Um, but I think ultimately, the thing when John found out from Sam, obviously he went through several degrees of processing, um, and we saw him go through each of those steps. Um, but it when. The thing that seemed to give John that moment of understanding was when Sam pointed out the promise that Ned had made and what Ned had done to protect John and that Robert Baratheon would have had him killed. And I think ultimately Sansa and Arya will go through a very similar process. And I think ultimately the book will stop at their mutual respect for Ned Stark and the sacrifice and the choice that he made. And I think they will accept through respect for Ned. Yeah, I think I think I agree with that. I think it's they're, they're going to be, uh, or, or Ned is the character that is binding them all together still. Yes. It is. It was notable last season, I think he was mentioned in every episode, which says a huge amount about his ongoing influence and i think it says a lot not just about the, the character but also the way that sean Bean played it that they could use that and we could see quite how much of an of an influence he was on all of his children and how they judge themselves by his standards still um 
And so, yeah, I think that that is the 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 thing which will bind them. And the one thing, this is just like sort of an aside, but sort of how it might help emotionally for John is that if you remember last season, he and Theon down at Dragonstone had a small heart to heart and Theon uh, was there and not really sure about his identity. And John was saying, you know, you can be a Stark and you can be a Greyjoy. You can be both because you were born a Greyjoy, but you grew up with the Starks. That's okay to have both identities. And that was clearly foreshadowing the fact that John himself was going to have to struggle with this same idea that he was brought up as a Stark, but he's also a Targaryen. And I think that perhaps Theon could be a person who could come to him and say exactly what John had said to him previously. You can be both a Stark and a Targaryen. It's not like you're having to abandon your Stark heritage just because you've discovered a little bit extra about who, who you are. Completely uh, agree. Yeah. Guys, we've got about another 10 minutes. So uh, if you have any other questions, now is the time to drop them in the chat. I will use this as a moment, actually, uh, while we're still here. We've got a few more questions definitely to be getting through as well before we finish. But Gemma, do you want to use this as a moment to let people know uh, what your channel is, where they can find you on the internet, all of those good things? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm Gemma, uh, with G, obviously. G for Gemstone. Um, I am Secrets of the Citadel on YouTube and on Facebook. I never go on Twitter. Please don't make me log into Twitter, but I am on there, I guess. Um, I'm on Instagram. I think that's about it, really. Um, yeah, if, if you enjoyed our conversation and you haven't checked out my channel already, it it would be an honor if you would do so at some point. That would be fab. Um, I've just released a book, which is very um, exciting, a collaborative book called The Throne Effect with many other amazing content creators, uh, Gray Area, Val from Because Geek, uh, Smokescreen, uh, Ideas of Ice and Fire. I cannot think of absolutely everybody right now. Um, Got Academy. Um, we all wrote a chapter each, and that is out now on um, ebook, and the hard copy will be out in May. So all those, all that stuff's on my Facebook. But just thank you for having me on, as always, Robert. You know, I, I love collaborating with you. Um, let's hope there are many more collaborations to come. Oh, there absolutely will be, and and uh, I will just add to what I've already said is that I would highly recommend you do go and check out Secret of the Citadel uh, as a channel. It provides, uh, and Gemma does fantastic videos, not just on Game of Thrones in season, but has got what I consider to be the best chapter by chapter breakdown ongoing all the way through the books as well, which I'm sure will be carrying on uh, well beyond the end of the, this season. Uh, so do check that out. And in answer to the question that people have been asking me a lot, um, yes, we know that we haven't yet finished the collaborations that we have, were doing on a number of smaller houses. Uh, we know that we've got, we've been planning to do the last couple in that series, uh, but obviously this this series suddenly appeared and we had to be covering that. So annoying as it is, <laughs> season eight got in the way, uh, but we will finish it off. I can't remember which two we're going. I think we're going to do House Martell and one other one. Uh, anyway. Man Ah, Manderley, that was it. So uh, we're going to be looking, doing studies of those two houses. So uh, that is coming. Uh, okay, so we've got a couple more questions to be going. And Mrs. Howard, thank you so much uh, for your uh, super chat. I didn't see a question attached to that, uh, but thank you. Um, Baba Husky saying, uh, the Blackwoods definitely don't study botany magic. Uh, <laughs> greenness ears and thumbs. <laughs> Uh, hashtag team bracken so this is this is a rather niche niche throwing shade at their weirwood tree it has to be said uh but yeah the um for, for those who are unaware in the uh, the blackwoods have got a huge dead weirwood massive i can't remember the exact word that they used for it but it's it's described as colossal i think it was covered um, in ravens exactly and it's covered in ravens and it's the symbolic as as you like but um uh, that's what's going on um 
is there anything else uh there's a lot of good uh, stuff coming through in the chat at the moment which i'll shall pick up on in just a moment but is there anything else just looking forward to episode two which now is just over two hours away guys get excited mm -hmm. is there anything that you're particularly looking forward to i want to know why aria has a bow okay because she's got a sword she's got a dagger she's laid some schematics on gendry for what appears to be some kind of detachable spear or lance of some sort and then we see her in the trailer with a bow and arrow and we did discuss this vast arsenal that that she seems to be acquiring but she couldn't possibly hold all of these items at once or lug them around with her on the battlefield why is she specifically picking up a bow and arrow at this point is there a specific target in mind i believe there is yeah i i think that's a fascinating question it, it's either there's a specific target or she's just trying out the technology to make sure that it works mm -hmm. uh it's almost certainly going to be a sort of a callback i think to it might have been episode one possibly yes, episode yeah. two well, when she's there and she's using a bow as a child uh, and we see that she's actually quite a good shot so it's not like completely out of nowhere the idea that she might use a bow she does know how to use a bow, and this is just a sort of a callback to that. Um, the uh, just saw in the chat, Highlander Services asking when am I going to finish my Tower of Joy videos and series. I was actually doing a little bit of work on that uh, earlier this afternoon uh, in this kind of weir weird period just before I'm going to be working on episode two videos very soon, uh, obviously after I've seen the episode and I've finished off my episode one video, so I thought, well, I should go back and do a little bit more on Tower of Joy. There are at least two more videos about the Tower of Joy itself, and then a couple more videos in the rest of that series, which are going to come probably the other side of uh, season eight, but hey, who knows, maybe I'll be managed to sneak one out somewhere in the middle of the season. Um, Lucifer means Lightbringer. Thank you so much. $6.66 saying, great show, guys. I'm putting out part two of my Endgame series in a few minutes. Thanks for the shout outs today, guys. Uh, we always love a bit of LML. Uh, please do go and check out his channel. If the mods could put a link, that would be much appreciated. I must admit, um, I haven't watched any Game of Thrones related content on YouTube because I've just, like yourself, Robert, been far too busy working on my own. The only reprieve I had was to go and watch LML's video. So I'm excited for part two of that. Excellent. And uh, I will definitely be having LML back um, at some point on this channel during the season. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Donald People saying, always a pleasure, Robert and Gemma. Great stream as always. Thank you so much. Um, guys, I think I am going to round this up now. Um, this has been uh, fantastic. Gemma, do you want to just very quickly remind everyone uh, again where they can find you? Yes, I am Secrets of the Citadel. Um, I've seen a few people. There's been a lot of people in the chat today. Obviously, the excitement is ramping up. Um, so it does appear that I am a new face to some people. I am Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel. Please go and find my channel if you haven't already. Um, that would be fabulous. But again, mods, chat, you're all awesome. So many donations, so much love. Really excited. Two hours to go. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, moderators, thank you. There was uh, there was a lot of work to do there today. Really appreciate that. And uh, you'll, there are three or four people who've unexpectedly found themselves moderators as well during the course of the live stream. Thank you so very much. Um, if you are actually one other thing, I always am trying and these to uh, to big up somebody's uh, post uh, um, show live streams last week. Gemma obviously wasn't watching, but I was bigging up her post show live stream, Yay, telling people you. to tune into that. Um, this time, as LML has just appeared on here, I shall big up his one. Uh, guys, after the show, LML will be doing uh, a live stream. So if you want to chat about that, uh, just discuss whatever was going on, please do go and check that out. There will be a link down there somewhere uh, in the chat, I'm sure. Uh, if you are watching this at all uh, later, watching uh, this not live, uh, then at some point in the next few seconds, uh, somewhere around here will appear a link to my other Game of Thrones season eight videos, and somewhere around here will appear a link to my Patreon page. Patrons, I cannot do this without you. Thank you so much. Um, Thursday, my live stream on Thursday will be focused largely on patrons' questions as well as stuff that's coming out on the chat. 
Guys, thank you so much. This has been absolutely fantastic. I shall see you again soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.